Well, good morning. First, let me say I, I really appreciate the invitation. I'm very honored to be here, and I commend you on the work that your organization does. Um, I was being from Wichita, and I'm from Kentucky originally, grew up in the very rural south. Um, as I've gotten older and moved to more urban areas, I really appreciate the opportunity to come together with like-minded people and have good discussion. Um, my name is Tammy Ray. I am now with Evergy. Monday becomes the real official day. So this is a really big weekend in our company. So if you go online to pay your bill Monday and it doesn't work, it, we're working on it. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to talk today about Evergy's renewables because I do think it's important. The, the fair majority of you are probably Evergy customers. So I think you need to understand where the energy coming to your house comes from and what part of that's renewable. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about personal investments into renewables, our own utility renewable programs that have been developed over the years, and then just briefly touch on some future technology. I know we're gonna get to some more of that, so I'll probably um, leave that for, for someone else to talk about. But just some statistics, because all good company representatives start with statistics, right? <laughs> we want the world to know what we're doing. But that's a really good map of what our combined company service territory looks like. So as you can see, when it comes to the Midwest, Evergy is a big player in the energy world in the Midwest today. Um, we do have um, 3,000 megawatts of renewables. A lot of people, um, they're not aware of that. You know, we, we've done a really good job in our company investing in renewables, but a really poor job of well, pouting our own horn, so to speak, of getting the word out there. We've invested in renewables uh, for several years and have really failed to make our customers aware of it. So we'll talk a little bit about those investments. So low carbon future. I know you mentioned the big E's, the environment and energy. As a company, as a utility company, we're committed to those same things. We're a Kansas company. Um, this is our home as well as yours. So we very much want to make investments and spend our dollars in a way that's to the benefit of our state and our environment. Uh, by the end of 2020, which is scarily not that far away, right? I mean, not that far at all. Um, we will have a wind portfolio of over 3,800 megawatts of wind. We will have reduced our carbon emissions um, from over 40% of our 2005 levels. So I think that's a really good um, indication of our commitment. If you can see our generation, um, the E for estimate, so from 2010 to 2020, um, our investment in renewables that was really slim here over 10 years has gone up considerably. When you choose to be the clean energy leader, you get some really great benefits of that. And as you can see, one of the big benefits has been our reduction in CO2. So as our retail sales have, is this cutting out as bad for yeah, you yeah, as yeah, it is yeah, for me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how to do this any differently. But you really do have to put your mouth like right yeah. on it. <laughs> okay, I got this. So we're well ahead of the portfolio standards that were set in Kansas many years ago. So Kansas had voluntary renewable energy goals. You, you've been in, um, educating yourself about this over the years, you probably realize that. We did not have an RPS or a renewable portfolio standard to meet in Kansas. Um, that was merely a suggestion. Well, as a utility, we bypassed that suggestion really a long time ago. So we passed that 20% voluntary goal and the, on the Missouri side, the RPS required 15% of our electricity sales to customers being renewable resources. We bypassed that one a long time ago, too. So we are well ahead, as a company, of the renewable portfolio standards put before us by both our state policies. We clean milestones. This is a really big deal. In 2017, more than half the power that came to your home, if you were an energy customer, was in the form of an emission-free resource. Um, and that's by nature of including our investment in Wolf Creek. That's what gets us there. If you're looking at renewables alone, just the power coming to your home today as an energy customer is about 37% renewables. Just by, just by choosing, or by, you don't, by not choosing, right? By, by <laughs> being an energy customer, you're already getting 37% renewable energy, over 50% emission-free because of our uh, um, and nuclear power plant out in Burlington, Kansas. That's a really significant number. 
That 50% renewables um, really sets us apart across the country. There's no other utility in the country today who can make that claim consistent. So we're really proud of that. So what that got us, I call it the green state. So this is the World Resource Institute um, uh, map that went out to corporate buyers. So if I'm a corporate buyer, an Amazon of the world, or a 3M corporation of the world, and I'm looking to build an estate that's renewable friendly, that's going to have products for me, I'm looking for these green states. So in 2016, um, we weren't green, and it was ugly. It was ugly, ugly to see this map and realize Kansas, with all the wind energy we had, could not, we just couldn't get that, we couldn't get the World Institute um, to make us green. So what have we done in the last few years to get there? What has been green tariffs? And I'm going to talk a little more in detail about that, but we're really proud of the fact that when corporations go to look for environmentally uh, clean options for energy and they want to build in the states that provide them then that, they're now seeing from a third-party resource that the Midwest is a really good place to go. So the U.S. energy projections, this is so that brown line at the top, that's where they show renewables. You were just talking about solar and wind and how in 2020 for the, or, sorry, in 2018 for the first time, new solar beat all other forms of new generation. That's going to continue as the price of solar comes down, as more opportunities become available there. But whether it's solar or wind or any other form of you know, renewables, everyone agrees from a capacity projection, renewable energy is going to continue to rise and be invested in our country. A really cool map of the wind and solar resources around the country. So the, this wind belt right here, um, it doesn't mean that solar is not a good option for Kansas. Today, Kansas is in the top 10 for a solar resource. So the question is, well, why don't we, that's the case, Tammy, why don't we see more of those little sunshine things out here in Kansas? Well, we're still the, we're, we're sort of the Sahara Desert of wind energy. So when it comes to economics today, and we're going to, we have to go with what makes the most economic sense. And from an economic standpoint, wind is just the cheapest for us to build and generate. So you'll see this. A lot of things, too, that this map makes me laugh. Um, I was spent four years in the Navy. Ironically, I was an electrician. I, I, so I've made this my career. But when I see solar farms in Maine, it just makes me laugh because I remember being this young 20-year-old kid in Brunswick, Maine, I, you know, my first time away from home, and literally leaving work at 4.30 in the afternoon and getting stopped at taps because the sun was going down. I mean, it was dark at 4.30. So the question always becomes, why is there so much solar here if the, sun, if the solar resource isn't great? That's always policy driven. So the New Yorks of the world, the Vermonts of the world, the Maine, those states have made a determination that they want to invest in renewables. And really, to be honest, not that cost isn't, isn't a factor. Cost did not drive this growth in a lot of cases. Policy drove this growth. So the utilities are investing to meet those same RPS standards that I talked about in Kansas and Missouri. They've been tasked with investing in that, of making it work for their grid and their customers. Um, so that's where you see that. You can see which states have created policy to support that and which states are, are still sort of lagging behind there. So again, Evergy Renewables in a, the big picture. I talked about the wind. We do have some hydro. hydro. We have a really cool... Um, landfill gas facility just north of Topeka where they're using the methane gas off a landfill. <laughs> They've got some, some generators in there and we, we get enough power to power about 5,000 homes in the Topeka area using landfill gas. So pretty small project in the utility world. I just think it's really a, a, a really cool opportunity. Um, where my specialty is, what I work in Primarily day to day, especially since post merger, is this 4.5 uh, megawatts of behind of solar. That's mo I'm sorry, it's the 76 megawatts of distributed generation solar. The 4.5 megawatt is utility owned solar. That's in two small solar farms, one in Missouri and then one small one in Hutch. But 76 megawatts of solar that our customers own. 
So that's what we refer to as distributed generation. That's rooftop customer on residential commercial homes. So how did we get that green Kansas? How did we, how did we get the World Resource Institute to give us green? We knew we had to look at our commercial and industrial renewable strategy. Commercial customers today want access to renewables, but they're really picky about it, I'm going to be honest. They need an economic product. They want to know that it's long-term price stability, right? If I'm a business and I'm planning growth, I want to know what I'm going to pay. Also, in the world of renewables, you'll hear the word additionality. That's a big word when you're talking to companies. And what that means is the Googles of the world don't want to buy wind energy from what a trade wind, wind farms that already exist, do they? They don't. They want to know that their investment created an additional wind farm. So they want to know that because of their commitment, more wind energy is being put on the grid. They really don't want to take advantage of what's out there. They want that additionality. So we were able to do that by green tariffs. And green tariffs have really transformed the grid. And that same resource institute shows us that, that um, if you look at you know, 2015, this was the number of utilities that had green tariffs. Just now, in 2019, that's what's currently under negotiation. So what is a green tariff? Um, a green tariff allows us to offer a customer access to renewables without putting it on site. So a great example of that is going to be um, we have a new product in Kansas called Renewables Direct. So we took 22 customers, large commercial customers, who wanted renewables, but their load, they didn't have enough load that, that was gonna make economic sense for them to go to trade winds and say, hey, can you build us a wind farm? But if we took all the load of those 22 customers and aggregated it together to one big load, it made sense for us to build it. So we have 22 customers, we built the wind farm, they're gonna get access to that wind energy, and for the first time, we are actually, it's actually gonna be cheaper than traditional generation. They're gonna save money by investing in that, um, that, the construction of that wind farm. That's a green tariff. If they don't own it, it's not on their property, but through a tariff that we got approved through our regulators, we're able to offer them a product. Um, and we have a couple more examples of that, but because most of you are just interested in what happens at your own home and not your company is I do want to talk a little bit about personal investments in solar. So whether you live in Kansas or Missouri, those are net, both of those are net metering states. And that's a, a sometimes a confusing word. Net metering and parallel generation speak to how you are compensated for exported energy. So if you put five kilowatts of solar on your rooftop, you're going to consume most of that. When you don't consume that energy and it comes back out on the grid, state law requires we give you full compensation for it. So if you've used 500 kilowatt hours from the utility and you sent us back 50, we're going to trade out that 50. You, instead of me charging you for 500, which I delivered you, I'm only going to charge you for 450 because I'm going to subtract that 50. That's net metering. That helps make solar more affordable, right? If the utility is going to compensate me at the full retail value for exported power, that brings that return on investment down a little bit. Parallel generation says, um, we're not going to do a one-for-one -one credit. You're going to pay for 100% of what the utility delivers to you. We're just going to give you a bill credit for what it would have cost us to generate that same amount of power for what you export. Parallel generation is for the larger systems. Net metering is a state law, both sides of the, of the state line, but they have size limits. So if you're a residential customer and you want to put solar on your rooftop, 15 kW is the largest you can install and get that one-for-one -one credit for exported energy. Um, again, Missouri customer solar rebates, uh, round two. In 20, uh, maybe like 20, 2005, 2005, they started with rebates in Missouri. Um, they went away for a while. October of 2018, we kicked off a new rebate program on the Missouri side where customers are getting 50 cents a watt um, for installed solar up until June 30th. Now, since that day at that time has passed, they're getting 25 cents a watt. So what does that mean? That, that, 70, that 72 megawatts of installed solar we have behind the grid, you can guess about 95% of that's on the Missouri side. 
because Missouri state policy has decided to incentivize and rebate solar, so it makes more economic sense. Um, just to give you some numbers on the Kansas side, uh, we have about 900,000 customers. On the Kansas side, we have about 900 of them with their own generation. On the Missouri side, we have about 5,000 of them. There's a smaller customer base, but we have more customers with solar because the rebate is the term, you know, it's, that's the incentives. No rebate in Kansas? No rebate in Kansas, not today. You got Having family. said that, though, the question always becomes, well, when do you, do you think we'll see rebates in Kansas? You know, I would like to think we would someday. However, I would hope that before we do solar rebates in Kansas, we do energy efficiency rebates in Kansas. It never makes sense to generate power on a home that's not efficient in using energy wisely. Missouri did go about that the right way. They had the energy efficiency rebates and incentives years before they started to incentivize solar. So I would, I think to start down that path, Kansas should start with energy efficiencies. But you know, Laura Kelly was at the Kansas Energy Conference this week. She didn't ask me my opinion, but um, if she did, that would be my opinion. Let's work on energy efficiency. Let's get people using power wisely, and then let's incentivize them to generate a portion of their own. That would be, the, to me, the logical way to go, and it was the, it is the way that, that Missouri chose to attack. Um, Casey Pinnell, we, we all have an interconnection process, so if you decide you want to install solar on your roof, there is a process you have to go through. Um, it's not terribly cumbersome, but it is paperwork intensive. Our engineers review all interconnections, and they, it has to meet utility standards and all that good stuff. Uh, it is a, it's multiple steps though, right? You have from the interest and post inspections and all to the time that we finally come out and switch out your current service meter for a buyback meter. There are lots of, of steps along that way. So it's not just um, plug and play today, right? You can go buy, this is a true story. It's a couple of years ago, I got a call from an, a meter analyst and she said, Tammy, we're getting back feed on a meter at this address. I said, Mariah, that's an apartment. I don't think we've got back feed. I think we have diversion. I think they're messing with the meter somehow. I said, let's just watch it. Well, another month went by. She was, we're still getting, it's not a lot, but it's a pretty consistent back feed on our meter. So I said, well, have someone do, let's do a ticket, let somebody go investigate. The meter looks good. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to call the guy. So I call this guy on the phone, and I'm like, you know, this is a strange question. I know it probably doesn't make sense, but for whatever reason, we're getting a backfeed on through our meter. Are you gener you, know, you have some form of generation? And he goes, yeah, my mom got us all these plug-in solar panels for Christmas. <laughs> and my first thought was, as a mom of three kids in their 20s, if I gave my kids a solar panel on Christmas morning, it would not be a good day in my house. I'm just saying, <laughs> this guy was very excited about, so what he was doing was plugging this panel into an outlet on his deck. He just hung it off the railing on the deck outside an apartment and it was plugged into an outlet. So similar to maybe what you see for campers and that sort of thing. That what amazed me was there was enough generation off that one panel he was hanging off his deck while he was barbecuing his burger on the grill that our meter picked up on it and we saw um, the excess going back on the grid. So we have an interconnection process, but we recognize that as the technology around solar changes, we have an opportunity to answer questions and figure out what that interconnection process is going to look like. Today, I just choose to ignore it. I think of it as an appliance. I don't know, what do you do with a guy that wants to plug in solar? Uh, not sure yet. So you may have heard that in Kansas, the utility imposed a new rate for customers who install solar. So it's called a residential distributed generation rate. That rate um, does include a demand charge. So for customers generating a portion of their own power, they do pay a lot less for their kilowatt hour charge. So that goes down almost by half. Uh, but then they pay a, a, a demand charge based on that moment of maximum usage. And there are some who would say, well, that rate feels punitive. Yes. There are some who say, when given the opportunity to go back on a standard residential rate, we have a whole host of them that don't want to go back because they realize it's very favorable. But the, the 
premise behind it, I can share, was that we knew that a solar customer who only pays us $14.50 a month, and there are customers out there, when you make a choice to put solar on your roof, from my perspective, you become a partial use customer, right? You're no longer a full, not a, you're not, it's not a full supply customer. I'm not meeting 100% of your needs, but I'm required to meet 100% of your needs the moment you need it. So all the poles and wires and transformers and everything that goes into meeting 100% of your needs has to be there. And that certainly costs more than $14.50 a month. So the, who pays for that? If, if $14.50 a month isn't paying for it, who would be paying for that? Well, that cost gets socialized to everybody who doesn't have solar. So we wanted an opportunity to make sure we were able to recover what it costs to serve customers. We've used demand charge for 100 years with, <clears throat> with, in our commercial rates. So that was very well accepted. We went through the... Uh, Kansas Corporation Commission, and we did get a separate rate for solar customers. And I will say, you know, I was there. I heard everybody say this was going to kill solar in Kansas. As the person who manages those applications, I can tell you that is absolutely not the case. I see four times more applications for solar today than I did six months ago. So it was not, it has not been detrimental um, in, at all. It is very different. It's a very difficult rate to explain. Um, we all, installers, myself, our people in the field, we work very hard to make sure customers understand it because demand charges are just difficult, but it has not been the end of solar in Kansas by far. Um, I talked about renewable programs. West Star Wind is one we have a lot of residential customers um, take advantage of. Over, I mean, we're almost at the, the over 30,000 customers now in 2019. They pay a small premium of a fourth of a cent a kilowatt hour to have to be guaranteed that their energy is sourced from a renewable resource. So in the world of renewables, there are two components that are valuable, the kilowatt hour and the renewable energy credit. The renewable, the kilowatt hours, that's easy to wrap our head around, right? That's what makes our lights come on. The renewable energy credit feels less tangible, but that's the societal benefit. That's, the, that's the, the environmental benefit of it, if you will. So if I'm a company and I buy the REC off of renewable energy um, through a program like this, if I use 1,000 kilowatt hours of energy in my home and I pay to ensure that 1,000 kilowatt hours of energy was sourced from a renewable resource to offset that. I own that REC, I pay for that, and I can, I, that gives me the opportunity to make that green claim. So when you hear Microsoft say our data center is powered by 100% renewables, they don't have solar on their roof necessarily or wind turbines in their backyard. It means that they're offsetting their usage by buying recs from a utility or on the market to offset that. So um, that's just a good thing to keep in mind. Two valuable pieces to every renewable energy kilowatt hour. And then we do have a couple community solar programs one that's currently active, but it is a big premium. Solar's just more expensive than wind. Solar's much more expensive than traditional generation. But we have 500 customers who pay us a little more every month to, because they felt compelled to invest in solar. And we were able to, to build that um, and provide that for them because we knew they wanted it. And then we have a solar subscription program. I talked about Renewables Direct with the 22 customers. And then all the potential disruptors that are, you know, that, the, that we as a utility have to be looking at. We have to look at microgrids. We have to look at, you know, deregulation, right? What happens every year in the legislature? There's a bill in place that wants to deregulate the utility. If that were to happen, what does that mean for us? How do we respond to that? You know, Google and Apple, they want to be in your home too. <laughs> We'd like to be there first. So uh, we have a lot of work to do to prepare for... You know, charging stations and home charging. What about fleet electric vehicles? If you have a fleet of trucks sitting there with full batteries, is that load the utility could draw on at 10 o'clock at night if the line goes down? You know, is the future get, get us to a place where we actually are able to, to draw power back out of those batteries to, so that we can keep the lights on down the street? Those are things that will be um, here sooner rather than later. But I do appreciate you being here. I know I've given you a lot of information. You've got more coming your way, but I do look forward to the question and answer part. That's my favorite. So make sure you get this coming. Good morning. Good morning. I guess this is on. 
Uh, first of all, Tom, uh, thanks for the invite to uh, appear today, and thanks to the uh, league uh, for having me here. A little bit of deja vu for me. It was probably five, seven years ago I came to make a presentation in this church, in this building. I think upstairs in a conference room, there might have been 15, 20 uh, females there, uh, women. And to look out now and see, what, 120 in this room or so, and I guess you've lowered your standards a little bit because I see a few men in the room. But, uh, glad to be here. Uh, a lot has changed in the last five to seven years when I made the last presentation. I'm sure it's quite focused on uh, wind only. But today I'm going to give a presentation about wind and solar. Oh, I thought it was me. Yes. <laughs> So what I plan to do today is, is I have a kind of a CAM presentation that is a 200-year view of energy in the environment in the United States. Now, I make that presentation around town, do high schools and other groups. I don't plan to do that today because that'd be a lot of uh, ground to cover in 30 minutes. I do plan to cover about 50 years, and I'm going to fly through it and get to where we are today. And I think it's important to find out why renewables? Uh, when did they start up? How, where have they come from? And let me just go to the first slide. And since we have, I think, a few, uh, few or more baby boomers in the room, you'll remember the 1970s. And we had our first oil crisis affecting primarily the transportation sector back in 73. Uh, I was just getting out of high school at the time, and I remember this. And, uh, I don't quite remember the guy there with the lawnmower uh, lined up to his, uh, his gas main, but it was pretty disruptive to the United States and around the world when the uh, Middle East turned off the spigots in response to politics in the Middle East. And soon thereafter, the United States and others started saying, we need alternatives to fossil fuels. Uh, at that time, the U.S. was approaching peak oil peak gas. We were running out of conventional oil and conventional gas. Drill a hole in the ground and it comes out of the ground. Uh, as we know now, we have unconventional oil and gas, the shale oil, shale gas. So we have plentiful fossil fuels. But back in the 70s, it was all about national security or economic security. And we need alternatives, whether that's biofuels to go into vehicles, or wind, solar, geothermal, at all for electricity. Uh, take note of the fellow on the lower left, right here, uh, because on the next slide, uh, back in uh, 1977, I graduated from my graduate program, and I, my first job out of college was with the Solar Energy Research Institute in Golden, Colorado. At that time, it's still managed by Midwest Research Institute here in Kansas City. Uh, Fifteen years later, that CERI became NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, gaining status with Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, Oak Ridge, et al. It's the nation's scientific laboratory for renewable energy. Uh, let me just point out that in this 200-year scenario, I go back to 1820. Why 1820? 1820 was the year that the, uh, the world had one billion living humans on the, on the planet. You can see in 1974, we had uh, hit four billion. And I'll start to make a point here later about population. So my first job at uh, CERI slash NREL was the, the director at that time was the fellow who had started Earth Day back in 1970. That it saves. So, a little bit of a small world there. And I should point out, uh, I've already skipped the slide here. In 79, we did have our second oil crisis. And that was the Iranian Revolution, hostage taking, et al. Again, that underlined the fact that we were relying upon Middle Eastern oil, whether it was from Saudi Arabia, Iran, et al. So, Sari Inrail became now a focal point for, for billions of dollars of research on wind technology, solar photovoltaics, solar thermal, 
uh, geothermal, ocean power, you name it. Um, and it took a lot of money to get those industries off and running, uh, to develop the technology from scratch, basically. But we knew a lot about wind power, wind has been used to pump water in the Midwest for many, many years. But how do you create electricity on a cost-effective basis? And it certainly didn't do it day one. It took literally decades to get to where we are today. And I'll go through that. So in the early 80s in California, uh, Tammy was talking about incentives. The state of California said, let's get going on a industry, wind industry in the state, put out incentives for wind to show up in the passes, the mountain passes of California, and have these very consistent daily uh, wind speeds coming through the, the passes uh, based on inland heating, cool ocean water, and that, that air was coming through those passes every day like clockwork at 3 p.m. Unfortunately, those incentives often can lead to bad results. And that was the case back in the 80s where uh, very inefficient wind turbines packed cl uh, closely together, spinning very fast on low towers with lattice towers, uh, encouraged uh, sites that look like this, if you've been out to places like Palm Springs, Palm Desert, you might see that. Or you may have seen it 10, 15, 20 years ago. And the, the down part of that was, uh, it was a mess, uh, visually, uh, efficiently, as well as from an environmental perspective, uh, especially with raptors. Raptors like to perch on towers. They like to dive off and chase uh, ground gophers and other things on the ground. And with fast spinning blades, a lot of those golden eagles, uh, bald eagles, and other raptors were getting whacked by spinning blades, and not a good outcome. And in fact, uh, not a good outcome because these turbines were not very economically efficient in the first place. They were propped up by incentives. So that set the industry, at least the wind industry, back by certainly at least a decade. And then uh, now, 15, 20 years later, a wind industry, a, a valid viable industry, starts to show up in Europe. And this is a photo of a project in the northern part of Germany. Uh, Germany has very high cost of power relative to the United States at that time, still do. Uh, they have a decent wind speed off of the Baltic Sea, etc. Uh, the Europeans have been always about 10 years ahead of us on all things environment, wind, solar. Uh, they've also been very relied upon nuclear energy, which is starting to change. And uh, just to, again, kind of jump forward here a little bit. Uh, in 2009, now in the United States, a uh, PV industry starts to emerge. And that's 10 years after what happened in Europe. Spain, Italy, parts of France uh, had gone solar in, in, in a fairly big way. And now starting to show up in places like, especially if you're talking about rooftop and maybe small community projects, in places like, uh, as Tammy mentioned, in Maine, in New Jersey, in North Carolina, uh, mid-Atlantic, not so much in the Midwest, here in Kansas. And then what's happened over the last really five years, and this is what I do daily now, uh, I used to be involved in the, the big wind side of our shop. I'm now involved in big solar. So we don't do residential rooftop, we don't do small KW systems or megawatt systems that might be five megawatts or less. We deal with 80 megawatt projects all the way up to 500 megawatt projects. And to give you some frame of reference, 80 megawatts of solar is about a square mile. So for a mile by a mile, you're seeing solar arrays, repeating rows of panels, one after another, that track the sun from morning wow. to the afternoon. And a 500 megawatt project that we're building in Texas, Texas being bigger and broader, a lot more land, and 
and uh, more remote areas for that matter, uh, that's about six or seven square miles of solar. So the, the difference between wind and solar is pretty dramatic. Uh, of course, wind is up in the air, catching wind speed. It allows a farmer, a rancher, or landowner to still run cattle, still farm the ground. Uh, and we use about 1% to 2% of the ground for the, the wind uh, platform for the, the foundation and the towers, the roads, the interconnecting system. In the case of solar, we're using 100% of the ground. And as you look at it, you say, well, that's not really necessarily true. What I mean by that is you can't farm it any further. You can't run cattle any further. But it's a very kind of porous power plant because you've got a row and another row 19 feet away and another row 19 feet away or either a square mile or five or six square miles. So there's an opportunity, uh, which I'll show on the next slide, but let me go through a few numbers here. In 2018, as, as Tammy mentioned, uh, solar became the number one new power source in the United States. Residential rooftop, commercial rooftop, maybe aside the, the buildings, even small community, and of course those 80 multi-100 megawatt projects. So number one in the United States, but a very small fraction of the overall generation mix because it's, it's now coming on. Uh, just to break that down, uh, 6 gigawatts of utility scale, which I showed you before, uh, about even between residential and, and non-residential or commercial rooftops. In 2018, last year, wind power produced, uh, Annie mentioned 37%, so we're in, we're in agreement on that, of the electricity generation in Kansas. It's the highest percentage contribution in the entire country. There are more megawatts installed and more megawatt hours being produced in Texas, but has a lower overall state percentage of power from, from wind. And then from a nation perspective, uh, wind was producing at the end of last year about 6.5%. That's against you know, big numbers for nuclear and coal and gas and seven, hydropower. And solar last year was probably less than 1% but just wait. So uh, Nextera, who's one of our competitors uh, for Power Light, is, is how they're known within the utility industry, announced recently that they won't build any more uh, coal for sure, nuclear probably, but not even new gas generation after 2020. And that's a, that's a huge announcement. So saying in their backyard in Florida, which is the Sunshine State, so you figure that they would be uh, favorable to, to solar. They're going to be going with basically renewables, primarily solar plus battery storage, to equate to a base load unit that they may build otherwise, which in earlier days would have been a coal unit or a gas unit. Uh, Tammy again mentioned on a, a slide, or had a few things on her slides about folks like Apple and Google, uh, the whole uh, uh, litany of commercial industrial customers starting to go heavy into renewables. In 18, Apple is now meeting 100% of its power usage by renewables. Some of it, or a lot of it, up on their rooftop out in California, but also a lot of it spread around the country. So it's not directly feeding their meter, but it's offsetting their usage. And in 2018, uh, we sell a lot of power to utility companies, wind and solar. And for full disclosure, we do sell 300 megawatts of, of wind power to KCPNL, uh, now Evergy, from a 300 megawatt project in Northwest Missouri. We're also in uh, daily discussions, or not daily, but uh, frequent discussions with uh, West Star KCPNL, Evergy, about new wind. So when they start talking about the, uh, the green program that they have, looking to incent yet another wind farm, uh, we hope to be, be providing that. So we're always in marketing our projects to uh, Evergreen. 
Also, for full disclosure, I used to be a KCPNL employee back in 81, 83, after I left uh, NRA and decided to move back to Kansas City. So, in 2018, uh, what happened was our primary clients were Evergy, OGE in Oklahoma, Public Service in Oklahoma, and Tulsa, people as far away as Alabama Power, selling them wind power from central uh, Oklahoma. And suddenly the Googles, Facebooks, um, the Culver's, T-Mobiles were now buying wind power or solar power from us. And we, we developed projects at risk. We put millions of dollars into projects to get them ready. And we'll say to Evergy, uh, and we'll tell them early on what we're doing. We've now put a bow on this project. It's ready to be built in a year and a half or two years. Are you interested? And they may or may not be. Or they may be interested maybe in somebody else's project if we have a competition. But we're also taking those same projects and going out to the, the CNI community and saying, well, what are you thinking? What are you, what are you looking for? So the CNIs have overtaken traditional utility companies as, as off-takers for our, either the power from our projects under long-term power agreements, or they actually just buy the projects from us, and they'll operate them separately from us. So the, the world is turned. It's not strictly a utility environment only now, but it's anybody who wants large wholesale megawatts of power. So I mentioned before that uh, solar does not uh, use 100% of the ground uh, physically. It's not like we're paving the ground. So one thing that our company is doing is we're working with NREL, my former employer, to come up with ways to take that square mile or that five square mile area that has solar panels and how do we best uh, treat that ground as if it's still in ag use actually not even an ad use, it's dormant, but it now supports uh, pollinators, pollinator species, and bees and butterflies, and, and the whole ecosystem. Because the panels rotate, but they don't make noise. They don't produce any emissions. Uh, yes, vehicles occasionally do need to go back and forth, enter a row to do maintenance on the arrays, but why not have something like this out there versus simply bare ground, and that's where we're headed. Also, uh, solar is going to be showing up in kind of non-traditional ways. Uh, Tammy mentioned landfills. If you fly into uh, Atlanta's airport, you come in from the east uh, on a westbound runway, you'll see this off to the right side of the airplane. And that's a landfill with a big cap already has the membrane on top. I think it does have uh, methane capture, mm -hmm. but it has the surface that is facing uh, east or southeast and southwest. And they said it's already intruded. Uh, why not put up there? That's probably about a megawatt or two, maybe not, not any more than that. And then you've got, this is a sewage lagoon in California a solar array on top. And then obviously, you know, there's a whole lot, how many, how many millions of acres, maybe tens of thousands of square miles of parking lots in the United States that sit there with cars that get overheated during the summer, and even if they don't in the winter, uh, it would hurt them to be covered maybe from snow and rain, and folks are starting to do this uh, in a distributed manner. So let me kind of jump to where things are headed. Uh, wind in, in the Central Plains, the PTC, the production tax credit, will be going away from wind. And as I mentioned before, there were years and lots of dollars being spent by taxpayers and by the feds right. through NRL and others to develop these technologies. Well, the technologies are now mature. They don't need any further subsidies. They will be going away. The sun's setting uh, as we speak uh, at the end of this year for wind. So what's happening now for, for wind to uh, keep up with the Joneses, solar at all, 
is they're making the systems yet more efficient, they're making them bigger, the, the towers taller, the blades longer, the nacelles bigger, and, and uh, more megawatts. And you can see just the, the scale of where things are headed. Um, and that might be more akin to an offshore turbine that will be showing up somewhere in Europe, or dare I say, off the east coast of the United States in the next uh, probably decade or so. Fairly contentious so far in terms of wind off the eastern coast. And I don't want to get into you know, the debate about that. Uh, we don't do offshore wind. We're all terrestrial wind. But I think this is going to start to show up off the east coast at some point in the future. It certainly is very standard in, uh, in Europe. So let me go back to population real quick. And this is now going to start to diverge uh, towards climate change. And Tom, how am I doing on time here? Nine minutes, okay. So 1820, one billion people. Today, at the end of this year, approximately 7.7 .7 billion people. And you can see where the numbers are headed in the future, 2050, uh, almost 10 billion. And so if you look at, you know, from ancient history to current uh, today, population has just spiked <laughs> since the 1800s. Uh, it's gone up dramatically. Well, it should be no surprise that as population goes up in blue, that CO2 emissions go up because we're driving vehicles, we're heating our houses with natural gas, uh, CO2 goes up the stack, goes on out. Um, fossil fired power plants emit, among other things, besides SOx and NOx and, and particulates, emit CO2 in copious amounts. So as population goes up and our energy use goes up, then CO2 goes up. And even if population rates, which have gone up since, you know, as baby boomers, World War II ended, lots of babies come on the scene, and the population rate is starting to uh, diminish, and even if it goes down at a dramatic clip for the next several decades, population is still going to be pushing that 11 billion number. Well, what does that mean for the planet? So if, if CO2 emissions are going up, then global average temperatures are keeping pace. When I say global average, we're not talking Kansas City, Kansas, United States, it's this is smeared across the planet. It could be Siberia, it could be Africa, it's, it's everything smeared together. Global average temperatures have gone up, up and down as it's following now the CO2 uh, increase. And just to show you a few examples, the last five years, actually the last four years, have been the hottest years on record for the planet. 2018 being, you know, it was kind of a slacker uh, a few years ago. Last year was a slacker. It was only the fourth warmest year ever. 2019 is not going to be a slacker. It's going to be already on pace to be warmer than the other four previous uh, periods. In fact, I just read this morning, uh, looking at uh, CNN online, September, 2019 was the warmest September ever on record. So it's, it's, I think it's already baked in that 2019 is going to eclipse all that. And I don't want to get into you know, too much of the, you know, you've seen images like this. That's Greenland this summer. Uh, Greenland is not supposed to look like that even in summer. And what, what I want to leave you with is uh, climate uh, change is, I think, is happening. It's happening in an accelerated manner. A lot of the, uh, I'll say the damage, uh, the, uh, the direction is already kind of baked in. It's a matter of what we do to start to arrest uh, the, the, the pace of that acceleration, or do we try to bring it back to some normalcy? <coughs> 
but the genie is starting to get out of the bottle. And when the genie gets out of the bottle, you start not only warming Kansas City and, and uh, oceans and the entire planet, you start to warm some pretty uh, cold, light, frozen areas of the planet. The Arctic Ocean, uh, Greenland, Antarctica, we know about all those. You start to, if you start to melt the permafrost, especially in the northern hemisphere, which has the, uh, the bulk of the planet's permafrost, you're going to start to release a lot of uh, methane emissions, which these are methane bubbles that got trapped in a, uh, a tundra lake. But when that tundra lake melts in the spring, next spring, that gas is going to go into the atmosphere. And this is a scientist from the University of Alaska at Anchorage demonstrating what those bubbles do. It's methane. You can, you can light them on fire. But when methane goes into the atmosphere, it's about a 30x multiplier in terms of uh, trapping heat compared to CO2. And just to give you an example, this is a uh, mega bubble that erupted in Siberia in the last year, and you can see what, what uh, maybe is, uh, is out there working. So uh, Tom mentioned that I just got back from Africa, and, and this is maybe the last two or three minutes, I'll be quick. Uh, my day job is, is big wind and big solar, and what I do is I traipse around the country finding sites. I'm, I'm the site guy. I tee things up for our projects to be built in five or seven years. But my night job is uh, my wife and I and, and a few colleagues, we started a nonprofit seven years ago that we take solar power, which has dropped, solar panels have dropped dramatically in price, uh, an order of magnitude or more. And uh, after having gone on a number of uh, mission trips or outreach trips down to Guatemala doing uh, dental work, and I'm not a dentist, out of the dental profession, I can hold a flashlight with the best of them to shine in the mouths of patients. But I thought my, my value was maybe better served by taking these panels that are dropping dramatically in price and saying, hey, where, is, where are folks who could use this power? Uh, and we would look for very high value opportunities, providing clean water, providing economic development, uh, providing education, uh, especially for girls. And so we looked around and quickly you, you wind up in Africa, maybe you could have been in India, but we wound up in East Africa. And you can see from the, the chart here that all the, the deep red countries, Kenya, Tanzania, et al., 75% or more of the population doesn't have access to electricity. Uh, so in a place like Tanzania, yes, Dar es Salaam, the, the largest city, has power. Uh, yes, there are a couple of cities that have power. But most of the country, when you get off the tarmac, the asphalt, the two-lane road, into the dirt areas, uh, you quickly go on to areas where there is no power. It is dark at night. It's kerosene lanterns, et cetera. So for the last seven years, we've been doing projects. We worked on a project in Tanzania providing lighting for a girls' dormitory in Tanzania, 96 girls. Uh, girls in Africa, like boys, they walk long distances to get to school. Girls are particularly at risk uh, walking long distances. And to house them in a 96-girl dormitory adjacent to the secondary school, you kind of need power, right? The girls can't be in order of room 96 in a dormitory. Uh, they need security lighting. They need lighting to study at night. Uh, we did a project there for two years in a row uh, in Tanzania. Uh, this is the solar array getting uh, put up on the rooftop. Just got back from Tanzania again just three nights ago where we're working on a large solar array, phase one. Uh, phase two will be done next year to double the array. 
This is a medical clinic run by a U.S. NGO, an American doctor, almost died on a Kilimanjaro, the Tanzanian, uh, yeah, uh, brought him down, saved his life, came back to California, said, I need to go back and, and uh, live in Tanzania, started this from scratch. But they have, uh, they do have grid power, but it's highly unreliable, highly expensive. Uh, they have 12 outages every week. So we were doing a solar project there. The last thing I'll leave you with is, and I stole this from the League of Women Voters webpage. <laughs> Same as the, the national webpage. And it was the, uh, the League's environmental goals. And it goes through and says, we support vigorous enforcement of uh, standards and policies and so forth. And what's happening in the United States right now with the, the current administration and the current uh, political landscape is whatever standards and policies are out there, they're not necessarily being broached or violated. They're, they're being taken away, right? They're being managed, they're being softened, they're being loosened. And you can see the list there of just a few examples. So uh, take it for what that's worth. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, uh, look forward to more comments from the rest of the panel here. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to be uh, talking to you about uh, technology I've been immersed in for about the last 10 years. It has great potential to solve a lot of problems. and. Uh, You'll learn a lot about that. I don't have a lot of time. I want to establish one thing right off the bat. I'm normally a little self-conscious when I do these things. Do my hair look okay? <laughs> I think it looks fine. Yes? Yes? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I started this company for the sole purpose of developing a technology called compressor energy storage. We don't have much of a choice in this country. Energy storage of one form or another has to be developed because the wind doesn't blow all the time, the sun doesn't shine all the time, and we have to have reliable delivery of electricity. That is either going to require energy storage or we're going to have to prolong the use of fossil fuels, coal power and natural gas power, and that's not smart. So I want to explain to you how we can affordably make this transition to clean energy with the assistance of energy storage. This is the technology I'm developing. And you'll see it takes great advantage of wind power at night. Uh, in all the great wind resources of the world, there's more wind blowing at night than during the day, which is unfortunate because there's little demand for electricity at night. But it's perfect for energy storage. You can effectively store that nighttime wind power, you have a great advantage. So our idea is to take advantage of energy at night in general, but in particular wind energy at night. And if you're looking at the prices of wind power, which I'll get to shortly, it is really cheap. And then you use that wind power to power these compressors that make a pressurized air that is stored in natural geologic uh, formations deep underground. Then during the day when the electricity is needed, you just withdraw that air and it blows through these expander generators here to produce an intermediate baseload power that goes out into the grid. And with my version of this technology, it's completely clean and incredibly cheap. Um, I just explained that. There is a hydrogen element at some point. Uh, I'd like to have a chance to tell you why hydrogen is going to be important to this country, but not today. Uh, this, uh, there was a, a study that came out just uh, about two months ago from the Smart Electric Power Alliance, and they did an analysis. They're looking at what is being done with energy storage by the utilities all around the country. And as you can see, we need to do more in energy storage right in this part of the country. There's just not a lot of attention yet the energy storage here. That's unfortunate. We'll find out, especially with my technology, you need to have a suitable geology. And I'm not going to get into detail about that, but I'm working on these uh, energy storage task forces with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy to help 
educate people, utilities, regional transmission organizations to help them understand that, especially in the wind corridor, these states right here, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, not only do we have the best wind resource in the country, but we also have the best geologic formations for compressor energy storage. We could, just in those states here, produce enough wind power and baseload power with my technology to power the entire United States two times over. It would lower prices and create millions of jobs in this country. Now, I'll just point out a couple of things that emphasize the, the advantages of my technology. Right now, battery storage is occupying all the attention in the energy storage world, but it's really expensive, and it just doesn't have the ability of the technology, my compressed air energy storage, to provide a lot of the things that are absolutely essential for reliable delivery of electricity, uh, like ancillary services, uh, ramping, smoothing, peaking, and baseload generation. But the main thing is the duration that the electricity is available. A battery will only be able to provide electricity two to four hours, and then it's done and has to be recharged again. With my technology, uh, compressed air here, it's on this line. If you look at this line here that's showing the duration, you can actually produce several days' worth of electricity from that air that's stored underground. You need to have the geologic formation large enough to contain uh, like billions of cubic feet underground of air so that you can do that. But the Department of Energy has a brand new program called 100 Hours, and they're supporting technologies like mine that are capable of supplying 100 hours of clean energy when it's needed. This is a very important slide, so I want to make sure you understand what's uh, contained here. There's a, a Wall Street investment firm called Lazard, and every year they produce two studies. They produce the levelized cost of energy that analyzes the cost of electricity from every generating source, uh, coal power, gas power, nuclear power, uh, everything. And they also produce the levelized cost of storage and they analyze it by storage type. What's important here, this is the unsubsidized costs of these uh, storage systems, and you will see, here's compressed air, all by its lonesome down here, as by far and away the lowest price, it's not even close. Batteries are five to 10 times more expensive than this technology. And when you include all the other advantages of compressed air, it, it really just shows that the potential for this technology is huge. Now, this is important. This is Lazard again. This is their levelized cost of energy comparison. Um, as of, I think it was just 2018, for the first time, the unsubsidized cost of both wind and solar power was lower than gas power, coal power, or nuclear power. The point to emphasize here is that if you combine wind power, and wind power at night is cheaper than wind power during the day, with the low cost compressed air energy storage, you'll have a base load generation source that is cheaper than any other type of electricity. So we have to work smart, take advantage of the technologies that exist, and we'll be able to solve climate change. We'll be able to clean up the environment. We'll be able to create millions of jobs in this country if we're smart. This is the, um, the more complete analysis of the price of wind power it comes from the Wind Technologies Market Report that comes out every year from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. They do a great job of analyzing this. Look at the price of wind, what's happened over the last 10 years. The price of wind power from this wind corridor now is down in the teens. 1.4 cents a, a kilowatt hour. It's nuts. That's, that's just unbelievably cheap. And it's not as cheap in other parts of the country where the wind resource isn't as good. I'm almost done here. Natural gas is not going to be the solution. It just isn't. In 2016, for the first time, 
natural gas power's emissions exceeded the greenhouse gas emissions from coal power. So it's not a solution. The natural gas industry will tell you that it is. It isn't. It's, it's doing as much or more now to create climate change than anything else. We have to get off of it. Uh, Mark talked a little bit about how methane is uh, better trapping heat than CO2. And a lot of that comes from the fugitive methane involved from uh, fracking. And natural gas power costs more than the combination of wind compressed air energy storage. And I want to mention the healthcare costs, uh, looking at subsidies. In that unsubsidized analysis, Lazard never includes the subsidies that the fossil fuel industry have, like healthcare costs. They don't include that. This, uh, from a Harvard uh, study oops, uh, by Dr. Paul Epstein, the healthcare costs of burning fossil fuels is $500 billion a year. These are real costs that you pay. You're not, you're not paying for it at the pump when you build your vehicle or when you pay your electric bill. But these are very real costs. All those things go away when we make this transition to clean energy. So uh, energy storage makes clean power possible. It reduces the need for extensive transmission line build-outs. And it's going to really contribute to massive job creation. It will actually lower energy prices, lower health care costs, and increase the reliable delivery of electricity. So, there you go. I've been advised to use the microphone. I'm not used to being in the front row. I'm a Presbyterian. Uh, first of all, there's um, while driving to Colorado, and uh, this might be one that, that uh, Tammy or, or Mark would be best to address. Um, I noticed that there are a lot of times when uh, the big wind turbines are just sitting there; they aren't turning. Why? Sure. So I'll take a step. He's probably got a more technical answer. I can tell you that oftentimes if you're driving down the road, you see wind turbines in a large uh, wind farm and they're not turning. A lot of times that's just a result of uh, curtailment. So elect electrons have to have load. It's all about supply and demand. When the load goes down and we have our force to, to scale back our generation, wind's just an easy thing to curtail. You can't just ramp down a coal plant or nuclear natural gas. So because we're always playing the game of supply and demand, if you see wind turbines, there's certainly a, a maintenance component and there's regular maintenance and scheduled maintenance and an unscheduled maintenance, but sometimes it's also just curtailment. We've had to curtail the electricity because the load wasn't there to absorb it. I'll take a stab at that. Uh, Tom, that must have been your question because uh, you <laughs> asked that question before uh, Panel started. Now, now. Uh, <laughs> Don't give away the, the uh, secret. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, the wind, A, the wind doesn't always blow, right? Even in, in western Kansas where it's going to blow your hat off most days, it, some days it does not blow. Uh, wind projects are usually referred to by capacity factor. And capacity factor in, in Kansas, eastern Colorado, if that was the, where that person had seen those, might be in the neighborhood of about a 50% capacity factor, which is really high. That, that's, that's really good. But that means that the other 50% of the time is not uh, all that robust. And so turbines have cut in speeds, they have cut out speeds. So if the wind speed is, let's say, 12 miles an hour, so if you step outside your car, yeah, the wind's blowing, but the turbines are not ready to produce efficiently until wind speeds get up to around uh, 13, 14. And so, literally, believe it or not, the, the rotor will get a kickstart to start it going, and then it'll run on its own when wind speed is above uh, 12 or 13 miles an hour. And this is all done based on forecasting. There's a whole lot of science behind it. When the wind speed gets up to 60 miles an hour, if you saw them not spinning when it was really, really windy, you'd say, what's going on there? There's a cutout speed, because think about these blades being as long and as heavy as they are. 
and there was a lot of stress on the equipment, especially if uh, wind speeds were expected to go higher. So they'll go down in uh, shutdown mode. Literally, they'll clamp the, the, the uh, shaft in, in the turbine behind the nose cone. They'll take the blades and start to feather them so they don't capture the wind as efficiently. There's a lot of science that goes into these, but literally if you see one uh, or a number not operating, it's probably because the wind speed is too low at that given time. Drive out there two days later, you'll see them spinning uh, nicely. And don't be confused by the slow spinning. I mentioned back in California in the 80s, they spun very fast. They were variable speed, meaning went down uh, faster, they spun faster. Slow down, they spun uh, slowly. Now the commercial turbines these days are constant speed, so they're always spinning at the same rate, which is slow to the eye, slow for the birds. But think about how long those shafts, those uh, blades are, and the tip is just screaming. And inside the shaft is screaming. And there's also gears inside that convert that shaft power to even faster spinning in the generator. So there's a lot of things going on that uh, uh, if you drove through Colorado or Kansas, they, they should be spinning most of the time. Thanks. Good enough. Um, well, here is one that's rather direct. What are Evergy's plans for energy storage and stopping use of coal and gas power? But 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 30 seconds. So, for, as a utility, we look for storage where it makes economic sense, right? Right now, we we can generate at Jeffrey at a very affordable way. So, until the state says we want to eliminate coal, we're probably going to continue to, to generate um, using the resources we have that make economic sense. Batteries make sense for us when we have areas of the grid that they have, a, we have a problem to solve and storage allows us to solve that. So instead of building poles and wires somewhere, we can use batteries. So we have a one, we have one small one megawatt battery uh, storage system that allowed us to use storage to, to eliminate a voltage and a power quality problem we had as opposed to building new lines. So I, uh, I don't think we have any short term plans for storage today, simply because we have lots of capacity. We have um, really great renewable resources and the pricing, I mean, to be honest, how much would our customers be willing to pay for that technology? We, lots of people, as you guys know, want to be green until they have to pay for it. And the price is just really high. So I'm, I'm not sure that we're going to see it in the short term, but definitely um, it's something we're all talking about. Well, just as a follow-up, you do have some excess capacity. Um, have you thought of retiring uh, coal um, resources to get rid of that excess sure. capacity? So we just retired two, um, two plants in our merger, um, two, uh, two plants of Placine, um, and I'm drawing up a blank on the other one, that was a KCPNL one. So we have retired two. Um, Jeffrey Energy Center, which used to be our base load that operated at about 80% capacity, is now only operating about 43, 44% capacity. So we're ramping down coal. In the big picture though, all our resources are managed by the Southwest Power Pool. So that's the local um, distribution. They, they determine generation across Nebraska, Kansas. So we're always looking at where can we get power the cheapest. So maybe that, that um, there's renewables in Missouri that makes sense. So we're not using as much coal and natural gas on our side. But we have retired two plants and using coal less today than we ever have. Um, in the 10 years I've been here. Okay, and here is one on the solar side. How do solar panels uh, stand up to tornadoes and hail? Uh, how, how durable are they? Uh, probably not so uh, well to tornadoes. Right? If, if you have a, I don't know, an F2, F3, whatever, wind or solar, it's going to do damage just like it would do any other structure. Maybe besides Wolf Creek uh, Nuclear Station, which is you know, designed to withstand uh, something even more severe. So it's going to do the damage to it. Uh, the systems of the projects are all insured. Uh, we're talking about hail, hail is a different matter. Uh, hail, large hailstones are routinely fired at 
panels in the uh, in the manufacturing facilities to test the the glass uh, structures, so that they can take a. And I've seen it demonstrated live, where literally out of a gun, and you've probably seen this on TV, a hailstone is fired at a at a uh, sheet of glass and it'll break. But a panel has tempered glass. Uh, and it's meant to withstand uh, large hailstones. I suppose if you had a state record hailstone, which some of the meteorologists in our company chase, because they like to chase storms, and they go out and grab hailstones and put them into buckets. If you took one of these hailstones as big as, you know, like a softball, and have it come down, there may be damage. But again, I'm sure uh, they'll have to be replaced and repowered. But uh, it's not routine that routine hail is going to do any damage. Uh, we have a number of people asking, what can we do personally as individuals to help with uh, quicker migration to renewables? Um, you know, we've heard about what the utility is doing. What can we do to help? Well, I, you know, one thing is what you are doing. Speak to your, if you have a passion for it, speak to your elected officials. Most, so much around the world of renewables is policy driven. Um, so uh, that would be the first step. Let your opinion, share your opinions and your voices with that. Um, you know, I, just, I want to uh, encourage you to do another thing too. One of the biggest problems that we have that is prolonging our problem is the issue of money and politics. As yes. long as the fossil fuel companies are able to influence uh, politicians, they won't always do the right thing. And when we're looking at renewable energy, energy that's cheaper and cleaner, there's every advantage you can get this. And you add in energy storage, you completely eliminate eliminated the need for fossil fuels. The only thing that's really holding things back is the will of the politicians to accelerate the change that will stop climate change. So I would encourage you also to, whenever you can, push for the issue of getting money out of politics, or if you can, that'll help a lot. So, in the, and on your own personal level, we're a reminder, the greenest kilowatt hour out there is the one you never consume. So if you're not using energy wisely in your home, if you're not turning lights off and investing in energy efficiency products and behaviors, from a personal perspective, where you have the opportunity to make the biggest difference is to remember, the greenest kilowatt hour out there is the one never consumed. I'll just add uh, energy efficiency first, whether that's the your house, electricity, uh, your car, how much, uh, how many MPG you get on your vehicle, perhaps a hybrid uh, electric vehicle at some point in the future. Uh, don't uh, be doing solar on a rooftop on an energy inefficient house, as Tammy mentioned. Uh, I think everybody you know probably drove here today. Know, check check what your MPG is uh, because what's going out the the tailpipe is associated with your efficiency. You got your own half of gasoline, you're producing half the carbon. Uh, okay, we also had someone who agrees with Tammy that we need some sort of rebate program for house efficiency, for new windows, for insulation, and so on. Um, what programs are available and what can we do maybe to improve those programs? So unfortunately in Kansas today, we have been unsuccessful in getting the approval for energy efficiency programs. As a utility, we've tried at least three times that I'm aware of where we've filed programs with the Corporation Commission to try to bring energy efficiency programs to Kansas. Um, the reality is we haven't got approval because we have a lot of capacity. So. States that have energy efficiency programs, they, the, the, the methodology is, if you allow us to spend X number of dollars educating customers and providing customers with rebates so that they'll use less energy, we can prolong building costly generation. So it's either spend the money to build generation or spend the money to get people to conserve power. Well, we don't need generation. In Kansas, we have a lot of generation. So from an economic standpoint, we've been unsuccessful getting approval to spend money on programs for energy efficiency rebates. Um, 
I'm hopeful that, that we're going to continue to try to do that. As a utility, we see the value in those rebates and that education. We see it, I, especially now that I get the benefit of working on both sides of the state. Missouri's had them for years. You, there yeah. really is an opportunity there, and we will continue to work to getting that, but it, it is out of our hands. Um, I'm just curious, uh, why does a program like that have to be administered through the utility? Why can't we, uh, you know, submit our, our slip showing we put a window in to some other entity to get the rebate? Oh, you certainly couldn't, in the, and when you submit it through the utility, the rebate's not being paid to you by the utility, it's being paid to you by the, the taxpayers. They're, the states just have the utilities administer those programs. In other states, Vermont's a great example, they have a third party vendor that administers their energy efficiency programs, but it's still a policy decision in that state to set aside X number of dollars to fund it. Um, the, having the utility um, serve as that conduit is it's just an option, but certainly not the only one. Uh, Tom, my take is, and, and uh, don't repeat this to anybody in my company or my industry, I'm, I'm speaking personally, is uh, we get asked all the time about, isn't your industry wind or solar subsidized by farmers, landowners, whomever? And the quick answer is yes, we are. Uh, lots, millions of dollars went into R&D back in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, and so forth. We're still taking advantage of the production tax credit for wind. We're still taking advantage of the investment tax credit for solar. Uh, but what I'd like to see happen is all those go away, which in fact the PTC for wind does go away. Uh, the solar ITC is going to sunset in the next three years. And have all subsidies for energy go away, including uh, completion allowances for oil and gas take a finite set of fossil fuels out of the ground, which have their own environmental implications, and you give tax advantages to the oil and gas industry, take away the incentives for the nuclear industry on waste disposal and on loan guarantees of multi, multi-billion dollar projects, take it away for energy efficiency, let everything go uh, based on market, but what about carbon? And suddenly, you're going to start to see things do a sea change from a fossil-dependent economy worldwide to a non-fossil clean energy. And let, that, let the chips fall where they may. And in fact, when that is, you may call it a tax, uh, there are a lot of folks in Washington saying, take that tax money and roll it back into yet more renewables, yeah. wind, solar, at all. So it's a reinvestment tax, uh, not going into, well, you can, you can debate how, who's going to benefit from that, but personally I'd like to see everything just go away and be based on carbon emissions. So sort of a libertarian approach, maybe the Koch brothers could get behind that. Yeah, that's a fine idea. The problem is, as long as, and these are subsidies, they're not called subsidies, but the, the cost of climate change and the healthcare costs that are in the hundreds of billions of dollars are real costs that we're paying. If you paid them at the gas pump, the, the cost of your gasoline would be about three times, literally, what you're, you're paying now in your electric bill would be much, much higher until there is some form of carbon tax, some way of holding the fossil fuel companies responsible for the healthcare costs and the climate change costs, getting rid of subsidies is just going to allow the fossil fuel companies to continue to operate without being responsible for the problems they cause. So those things have to be done too. Um, NPR had a program uh, a few weeks ago talking about worn out wind turbines and some of the challenges of uh, disposing them. Um, could you address that? And what do you do with one of the things when they wear out? The only thing I will mention, that I know very little about it, but I just heard the plant manager from Siemens and Hutch, um, I was sitting at a table at lunch with him, and he was talking about a new recycling program where they are actually 
taking old turbines and blades and they have a, they now have a recycling mechanism in place to make use of those. You may know more about what they're doing, but I was I had never heard of that, but it does seem like that they are planning again they they know these are failing. They know we're getting into a, a time in history where, where we're gonna have this issue. So they are looking at the recycling option. Wind turbines, just like solar panels, uh, have a, a life, a useful life of, let's say, 25 to 30 years. And a lot of those wind turbines that have been put up in, uh, let's say, 2007 and beyond, they haven't gotten to that point where they're being uh, decommissioned. Uh, even if they are de decommissioned, there's going to be something coming in right behind it. Those, those turbines will be repowered. The panels in 25 years will be repowered, the racks, the trackers, all that's going to stay out there. New panels will come on because they 25 years out, there's always going to be something better. And at some point, there's that economic point where you say, take out the old stuff, put in the new stuff. So now recycling comes in to, to, to play. What do you do with the old stuff? And the industry is working hard on that. I think they need to work harder because those 2005 or so wind turbines are getting long in the tooth or they were installed early in you know, the last decade. And it's going to be prevalent in the future. So uh, I'm glad to hear that the industry, which they are, are looking at recycling fiberglass blades uh, for wind turbines, recycling silicon for old uh, solar panels, uh, etc. I suggested they use nacelles for tiny home communities. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like they're huge inside. I'm like, okay, let's take all these old wind turbine nacelles and make tiny homes out of them. <laughs> Tam, Tammy, a few people have asked, um, could you discuss the solar subscription program? They wanted to know some of the details. Sure, so um, a solar subscription program um, will allow you to pay a premium for a, a partial, a chunk of solar energy. So um, our community solar program on the West Star side, I'm more familiar with, but it is a subscription program. So customers pay 20, around $27 a month per KW. So I know we have 120 KW off the generation of that solar farm. So every month we take the generation, we divide it by 120. If you have one, 120 of that, and whatever that generation is, whether it's 200 kilowatt hours or 400 kilowatt hours, that's subtracted off your usage. So you're paying for a piece of the generation off solar, so you're subscribing to, um, to that uh, generation of that solar farm. So some months it's a little more, some months it's a little less. It's always a premium though, but it does allow people the opportunity to invest in solar without putting something on the roof or um, a large upfront investment. Residential customers today are spending between eighteen and thirty thousand dollars to put solar on the roof. So wow. that that cost um, is a real hurdle for a lot of people. So this allows them a uh, way around that. Okay, um, you had mentioned deregulation, and uh, Mark and uh, Joe might know some of this as well. But uh, do you see the push to deregulate? positively or negatively when it comes to uh, developing renewable energy? Yeah, uh, deregulation uh, historically uh, means at a real high level at a vertically integrated uh, company like KCPL, Westar Energy, that does generation, transmission, distribution to your houses, it's broken up. And they can stay in, in uh, those different pieces, but they're going to have competition primarily in generation, uh, less so in transmission, less so in distribution. There's no reason to have two sets of wires going all over the city to provide power. But uh, several areas like Texas, which makes their, their own country, or off did deregulation a number of years ago. And uh, the incumbent utilities down there that provided, they generated the power, coal, gas, maybe a little bit of wind, uh, now had to compete with folks like us. When we could go down and build a wind project, sell power into the wholesale market, and look just like them from a generation perspective. 
Uh, we still had to transmit the power, and that was on maybe incumbent utility lines all the way to the meters. Uh, it's also happened in a number of states in the Northeast, uh, Illinois being a Midwest company or country state that has gone uh, deregulated. Uh, a few others in the Northeast. It's been met, met with mixed results, but I think the, uh, the net effect in Texas has been, that's why Texas is now the number one wind state in the country, because lots of folks piled in and maybe thought they could do a better job of generating power at a lower cost with renewables than Texas utilities and Houston Power Line, et cetera. Uh, that's going to be quite a while, I think, for that to show up in, in our backyard here, uh, unless something you know, major changes from the rate base and others. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been met with mixed results, but in certain states, it's been a, a big boon for renewables. Um, speaking for California, deregulation there was a disaster due to <laughs> some bad actors. But um, Tammy, here's a technical question for you. Does renewable mean CO2 reduction? Uh, and does that mean that it includes nuclear? Hmm. No. Emission free, we refer to uh, emission. We use, yes, we use nuclear when we talk about emission free. But when we talk about CO2 reduction, um, our reductions in CO2 have been a real direct result of not only our investment in renewables, but we had years of major investments in um, our plants. We did huge scrubber um, initiatives. So when I talk about our company CO2 reductions, that is a result of scaling back coal and natural gas because of our renewable investment and the work we did on those existing plants to reduce the CO2. Didn't you just do some uh, stuff on Lysine here not too long? Yes. Yeah, and you're was... still going to close it? Uh, is... No, I don't, I cannot remember which two were closing. I know we closed Gordon Evans and Murray Gill in the Wichita area. I think Lysine is staying open and then there's one on the, on the Missouri okay. side. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, Joe, you've been left out, so here's a question for you. <laughs> What are the current barriers to Joe's solution, and how can we help accelerate adoption? You now, you can't ask for investment dollars. <laughs> no, 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 no. There have been some um, technological barriers uh, for the longest time. Just with, uh, speaking of my energy storage technology, uh, it was uh, mistakenly understood that you had to have uh, uh, salt formation deep underground. That was the only geologic formation that would work. And we're very limited to those. The one spinning case plant in the United States is in uh, Alabama, just 40 miles north of Mobile, where there's, there are lots of uh, these salt dome formations deep underground around the Gulf area. So we had to prove, I maintain, and I've been working with scientists at Sandia Labs, Brookhaven Labs, at NREL and other places, to try and get people to understand that there are actually four types of geology that are suitable for advancing this technology. And we had to prove it. So I've been pushing the Department of Energy for years to conduct a test using a depleted gas well. Um, and the gas industry had been spreading rumors for years that if you put pressurized air in a depleted gas well that it would blow up. That was nonsense. The scientists and the best engineers knew that you're not going to have any problem. You have to have some type of ignition event to create that problem. So uh, just recently, we did conduct a test fill, and it is, this was huge. It was a 500 million cubic foot um, wow. formation in California. And uh, Pacific Gas and Electric was kind of the monitor supervisor of this test. But they set up this array, a temporary array of compressors. They filled it, and then they went through exactly what would happen in an operation where you would withdraw and inject uh, to just uh, duplicate the yeah. exact conditions of a compressed air facility. And as we've been saying all along, they did this, no problem. So now, uh, and this just happened very recently, so there's a lot of the problem with advancing this stuff is just knowledge. People don't understand the technology and the fact that we've now opened up the, the door 
to geologic formations where 80% of the United States has some type of geology that would work for this. And then it's cost. Not all geologic formations are the same. It's really expensive to carve a cavern out of a, a salt formation using solution mining. You end up with a gigantic amount of, of brine that has to be disposed of in an yeah. environmentally friendly way. So what I maintain all along, it's, it's going to be more effective. We'll see a much faster growth if we take advantage of the other geologic formations that are suitable. And then it, it's mainly just ignorance. People just don't understand the technology yet. And then on the regulatory side, um, we had to uh, get the support of FERC to uh, create a level playing field. And FERC only recently passed two orders that were very, very important to advance uh, energy storage in general. It's FERC Order 841 and 845 that have gone a long way. We're still now working to educate regional transmission organizations to help them understand what these orders mean. And then uh, getting back to the uh, technology, the one um, element in, on the technology side that I've included that is completely unique to what, what I'm trying to do with this technology involves uh, hydrogen. The two existing case plants in the world uh, have uh, combust natural gas to heat the air before it hits the turbines. I didn't want to use any fossil fuels in mine, so I had to figure out a way to uh, combust renewable hydrogen. I've done that. I've been working with some major global companies, Siemens uh, most notably, to incorporate my idea into their manufacturing process. And so now uh, we can have a completely clean case operation. So there are a number of things that would contribute to holding it back. Okay, on that note, um, we've gone through all our questions. And uh, please join me in thanking our panel. for. <laughs>